الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين الحديث الرابع والثلاثون عن أبي سعيد الخدري رضي الله تعالى عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من رأى منكم منكرا فليغيره بيده فإن لم يستطع فبلسانه فإن لم يستطع فبقلبه وذلك أضعف الإيمان رواه مسلم On the authority of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu anhu who said I heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say whoever of you sees an evil let him change it with his hand if he is not able to do so then let him change it with his tongue and if he is not able to do so then with his heart and that is the weakest of Iman, or that, that is the lowest phase of Iman. This hadith was reported by Imam Muslim, rahmatullahi alayhi. Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have begun hadith number 34. Before we actually speak about the hadith, I will, there is one very important individual I want to speak about, and that is the teacher of Imam Muslim. The individual who Imam Muslim heard this hadith from. And we will see that he wasn't only the teacher of Imam Muslim, he was also the teacher of other great individuals as well. This was the great Abu Bakr ibn, ibn Abi Shayba. Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba. So Abu Bakr are more famously known as Ibn Abi Shayba. This is what he's famously known as. But we will see why we have to differentiate because there was not only one Ibn Abi Shayba, there were a few. So we are speaking about Abu Bakr, Ibn Abi Shayba. His name was Abdullah Ibn Muhammad. Obviously Abu Bakr was not his real name, this was his kunya. His name was Abdullah. And his father, his, his father, his name was Muhammad. His grandfather was al, al, the great Qadi Abu Shayba. So his nisba over here, as we see, he's known as Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba. Abu Bakr, the son of Abu Shayba. Abu Shayba is actually his grandfather. He is more famously given nisba and attributed to his grandfather, who was a great qadi, Abu Shayba. So ibn Abi Shayba, Abu Bakr, rahmatullahi alayhi, he was known when Imam Dhahabi, rahmatullahi alayhi, introduces him. He says, huwa al-imam. He was the great imam. He was al-alam. He was a sign, an ishara sign of Islam. He was also known as Sayyid al-Huffaz, the master of the Huffaz of Hadith. And we spoke about a Hafid al-Hadith, what that entails. It entails a person who has memorized thousands and thousands of Ahadith. So he was known as Sayyid al-Huffaz, the leader of all the Huffaz al-Hadith. And he was also um, Sahib al-Kutub al-Kibar. He wrote a few very famous books. One of them being his famous Musnad. But his most famous book, and obviously he also wrote a book of Tafsir, but his most famous book is known as Al Musannaf. Al Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba. Now, Al Musannaf, it's one of the, aside from the famous six books of Hadith, this is also one of the most, most famous books of Hadith. If we look into the Al-Musannaf, a lot of the proofs within the, for example, Hanafi Madhab, they come from, the Ahadith are mentioned in this book of his, Al-Musannaf. So if we look into the books of Fiqh, a lot of the Dala'il within the, um, the Fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa, the Dala'il come from Al-Musannaf, where the Hadith is mentioned in his book. So we'll speak again, who he is and what era he lived in. One thing that's interesting is that his entire family, they were all, Imam Dhahabi, he mentions, فَهُمْ بَيْتُ عِلْمٍ His household was a household of knowledge. So, <clears throat> his brother is the great Hafiz Uthman ibn Abi Shayba. Now, Uthman ibn Abi Shayba, he was a great Hafiz al-Hadith as well. He also had great majalis and great gatherings of Hadith in the city of Baghdad during his time. He also had another great brother. His brother's name was Qasim ibn Abi Shayba, who was also a, uh, a scholar of hadith. However, scholars of hadith, they say that 
Qasim, his brother, he was not a strong narrator. He was weak. He was da'if. But his other brother, Uthman, was a hafiz of hadith. He was known for his, his strength and his, his itqan as well. His son, he is also known as al hafiz al-Hadith as well. His son, his name was Ibrahim ibn Abi Bakr. So just in this household, you have three individuals who are known as hafiz al-Hadith. Abu Bakr, rahmatullahi alayhi, we're speaking about his brother Uthman and his son Ibrahim. And obviously their grandfather was the great Qadi Ibrahim. So Abu Bakr, rahmatullahi alayhi, he named his son after his grandfather. They shared the same name, Ibrahim. And then Imam Dhabi, rahmatullahi alayhi, he says, وَأَجَلُّهُمْ Abu Bakr. The most noble of their entire family when it comes to, to science, the science of hadith and ilm, was Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, he was at a different level of, of, of knowledge out of his entire family. So continuing, Imam Dhahabi, he mentions, هو من أقراني أحمد بن حنبل وإسحاق بن راهوي وعلي بن المديني. He was from the contemporaries. He was from the contemporaries of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. He was also from the contemporaries of Imam Ishaq ibn Rahaway. If you guys remember, Imam Ishaq, he was the teacher of who? Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi. It's mentioned that because of Imam Ishaq ibn Rahaway, because of his targhib and motivation, Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, began writing and compiling his Sahih al-Bukhari, the, fa the very famous book we have today. So he was from these individuals, you can say era. They lived in the same era. They were all contemporaries of one another. So it mentions, طلب العلم وهو صبي. He started this path of knowledge when he was a young child, when he was a teenager. Imam Dhabi mentions he was actually 14 years old when he began this path of knowledge. In Imam Dhabi, he mentions that وأكبر شيخ له هو شريك هو شريك ابن عبد الله القاضي. Imam Zahabi, he actually, you know, he has this habit whenever he writes about the great individuals of the past, he mentions all their teachers. He goes, you know, حدث من and so forth. He mentions all their teachers. But Imam Zahabi, he singled out one of his teachers. Aside from that big list he wrote of who his teachers were, he singled out one of his teachers. But he didn't only single him out. He said, وأكبر شيخ له. His greatest shaykh, meaning the person who he was closest with, was the great Qadi Sharik ibn Abdullah. What does this tell us? This tells us that this great Qadi Abu Bakr, rahmatullahi alayhi, he had a mentor. He had a mentor in who? Sharik ibn Abdullah, who was known as his Akbaru shaykh. Imam Dhabi introduces him as his main shaykh, his main mentor. And emphasizing the importance of having an individual we can always go to and make mashwara with as a mentor, right? These individuals, even though they were great, they always had someone greater above them. We spoke about this in the past as well. And Imam Dhabi, rahmatullahi alayhi, being a student of Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullahi alayhi, he mentions this. That is his greatest shaykh, his biggest shaykh was the great Qadi Sharik, rahmatullahi alayhi. So Imam Dhabi, he goes on and he says, كَانَ بَحْرًا مِّن بُحُورِ الْعِلْمِ says Abu Bakr rahmatullahi alayhi, he was a ocean from the oceans of knowledge. He was something else. وَبِهِ يُضْرَبُ الْمَثَلْ فِي قُوَّةِ الْحِفْظِ And whenever people speak about him, they give him as an example of being a person of, whenever they speak about people who have very powerful memory, a great memory, they always speak about Imam Abu Bakr. Ibn Abi Shayba, they speak about his great memory. This was one of the things he was known for, aside from his very famous books. So some of his, again, Imam Dhabi mentions many, many of his teachers, but some of his teachers include Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahmatullahi alayhi, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Imam Waki' ibn al-Jarrah, Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan. These are giants of the tabi'een and tabi'ut tabi'een, every single one of these individuals. And there was, he had more teachers, but these were some of the, some of the ones I decided to, to speak about. وَخَلْكُمْ كَثِيرٍ بِالْعِرَاقِ وَالْحِجَازِ well, Many of his teachers were from Iraq and from Hijaz and so forth. Some of his students, now this is interesting. Some of his students include Muhammad ibn Ismail. Who was Muhammad ibn Ismail? Imam Bukhari. Imam Bukhari. A lot of people, you know, it's, it's quite interesting. They quote Imam Bukhari, but 
They don't know his name. His name was Muhammad ibn Ismail. And you see, if you look into the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, many times it starts, the Sanad of every Hadith begins with Ibn Abi Shayba. So he was one of the great teachers of Imam Bukhari. He was also the very famous teacher of his student included, Muslim ibn Hajjaj. Who is this? Imam, Imam Muslim. His name was Muslim ibn Hajjaj. So he was also the great teacher of Imam Muslim. This hadith is actually narrated by Imam Muslim. He was also the great teacher of Suleiman ibn al-Ash'ath. Suleiman ibn al-Ash'ath is who? Imam Abu Dawood. Obviously, these are all the very famous uh, scholars of hadith who compiled their books. Sunan ibn Sunan Abi Dawood was, his name was what? Suleiman. He was also the famous teacher. His student was who? Muhammad ibn Yazid. Who is this? Imam Ibn Majah. Imam Ibn Majah, who wrote the very famous Sunan, Sunan Ibn Majah. And it's mentioned that this, this, the students of um, Ars Afwan, it's mentioned that Imam Nasa'i, Imam Nasa'i also, who was the great uh, compiler of Sunan, Sunan Nasa'i, his name was Ahmad Ibn Shu'ib. Um, Imam Nasa'i actually learned from the students of Imam Abu Bakr. So you see here what Imam Dhabi is doing here. He is mentioning all the very famous compilers of hadith. Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Imam Abu Dawood, Imam Ibn Majah, Imam Nasa'i. These, there's actually six. What's the last one we're missing? Imam Tirmidhi. So it's actually mentioned that Imam Tirmidhi, he did not learn from Imam Abu Bakr, Rahmatullahi Ali Ibn Abi Shayba. So if you look into the Sanad and the Asanid of the Jami' of Imam Tirmidhi, it's mentioned that Imam Dhabi says, Imam, Imam Tirmidhi does not even mention his name in his Asanid. Like he didn't take any hadith from him, or maybe he didn't hear any hadith from him. Wallahu alam. But all the other five famous six books of hadith, all the compilers of these books, they were all his students, including Imam Bukhari, including Imam Muslim. So he had a great impact in the, I mean, in some of these individuals' lives. He was a great scholar of hadith. Some of his other students include Imam Ahmad, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. If you look into his Musnad, his book of Hadith, you see that many of his chains of Hadith come from Ibn Abi Shayba. They were also contemporaries, but Imam Ahmad also took Hadith from him. And another very famous student of his, Imam Dhabi mentions, Wa Ahmad ibn al Hassan al Sufi. This is Imam Dhabi mentioning this. Why did I? And again, Imam Dhabi mentions many, many, probably like 30, 40 students of his. But I decided to choose these ones specifically. Why did I mention this student of his? And I, I found this interesting. It's because Imam Dhabi, he mentions that this individual, he was known as a Sufi. A Sufi, yani a person who practiced, a person who was practicing Tazkiyah, right? He was a person who was purifying himself on that, on that path. What this shows us is that not all Sufis are the same. Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi in his Majmu' al-Fatawa, he categorizes Sufis to three different types. This is in his Majmu' al-Fatawa. And one of these groups, he categorizes them as hum, hum salihun, hum rijal, they are individuals who are righteous. Right? He classifies one categories of, you know, people of Tasawwuf as people who are righteous. This is Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi. Imam Dhabi is doing the same thing here. He says that one of the students of Ibn Abi Shayba was who? Was the great scholar Ahmad ibn al-Hasan al-Sufi. So again, we should not live, you know, obviously we see different things people are doing, but we should not paint everybody with the same brush. We should not paint everybody with the same brush. This is the point I wanted to make by mentioning this individual's name. So now one of the students of Ibn Abi Shayba, known as Amr ibn Ali, he mentions an incident. He says, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحَدًا مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحَدًا أَحْفَظَ مِنْ أَبِي بَكْرِ بْنِ أَبِي شَيْبَةً قَدِمَ عَلَيْنَا مَا عَلِي بْنِ الْمَدِينِ فَسَرَدَ أَرْبَعَ مِئَةَ حَدِيثًا فَسَرَدَ أَرْبَعَ مِئَةَ حَدِيثًا حِفْظًا وَقَامَ So he mentions that one day, um, he said, I've never seen anybody who had a stronger memory than Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba. His memory was just out of this world. And Imam Ahmad, he also mentioned this as well. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal also uh, praises him by his memory. He says one day he came to the gathering 
And he came with Ali ibn al-Madini. And Ali ibn al-Madini, who was another great scholar of hadith in, in that time, and he said, فَصَرَدَ أَرْبَعَ مِئَةَ حَدِيثٍ He began reciting 400,000 hadith. I'm, I'm not even, this is أَرْبَعَ مِئَةَ حَدِيثٍ He began enumerating 400,000 hadith in one gathering, and he did not leave until he recited all that 400,000. And everyone was just in shock and in awe. And this is Imam Dhahabi mentioning this in his Siyaru Alam al Nubala. So Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba, he was, his, his memory, again, this is one he's, he's known for this. And there's many, many examples of people with great memory. He is one of those examples people always speak about. Right? So he had, him and his brother, you know, they had, as I mentioned, his brother Uthman and his brother Qasim, they had durus of hadith and in Baghdad. And their majalis, especially the majlis of Abu Bakr, it would reach at times 30,000 students. 30,000 people would come listen to his dars of hadith. He was an individual who, ajib. One thing that Imam, Imam Dhahabi mentions, he says, كان أبو بكر يقعد عند الأسطوانة وأخوه ومشكدانة وعبد الله بن براد وغيرهم كلهم سكوت إلا أبا بكر فإنه يهدر. He said Abu Bakr, Imam Abu Bakr, he, he used to give his dars of hadith at times on a ustuwa. Ustuwana is like a cylinder column type of thing, kind of like an elevated area. He would sit there and he would give his majalis. And one of the individuals, his name was Mushkdana. Mushkdana is actually Mushkdana, it's a Farsi word. Coming from a person who, you know, Mushk, right? A musk. So he says it's Wi'a'u wi'a Misk. This was his nickname because he used to always have musk on him. <laughs> So his nickname in Arabic was Mushkdana, Mushkdana from the Farsi word. So he says that he had this cylinder or this platform he used to always sit on. One of his contemporaries known as Ibn Adi, he says, He says, جلس إليها بعده علقمة وبعده إبراهيم وبعده منصور وبعده سفيان الثوري وبعده وقي وبعده أبو بكر بن أبي شيبة. He says this is the same, you can say, elevated area or cylinder type of platform that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud used to sit on. It was passed down. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud used to sit on this exact same one. And then when he passed away, his student Alqaba ibn Qais would sit on it. And then when he passed away, his student Ibrahim al nakhai sat on it. When, when he passed away, his student Mansur sat on it. When he passed away, his student Sufyan al thawri sat on it until it finally reached Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba. And Imam Dhahri mentions this. So this was something that was passed on from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He used to teach from the same, um, the same um, you can say, kind of uh, elevated area. Interesting. Now, so during the year... 234 after Hijra, the Khalifa of that time, his name was Al Mutawakkil, he gathered many of the Fuqaha and Muhaddithun in Baghdad and he gathered them to basically refute all the Mu'tazilis and the Jahmis of that time. You know, the, the, the fitna of, of the Mu'tazilis and the Jahmiya at that time increased a lot. So the, uh, the Khalifa of that time gathered all the most famous ulama. And one of the ulama who he called to this meeting was Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba. So he was big in actually speaking out and refuting the Mu'tazilis in his time and the Jahmiya in his time as well. So this was the great Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba. And I mentioned many ulama, they, they praised him for his, I mean, there's so many quotes I can mention to you here today, but um, that will take away from the actual dars of hadith itself. He passed away in the year 235 after Hijrah. Th this was the great Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba. And we don't hear too much about these names, right? We don't hear too much about these names. But these individuals, they were behind many of the most, you know, one of, many, of the mo many of the greatest scholars our ummah has ever seen. This individual was behind many of them, including almost every single you know, the Siha Sitta, the six famous books of Hadith, he was the teacher of five of those individuals. So he played a very crucial role in, in um, developing these great ulama and these great scholars of Hadith. It's actually mentioned that this, this ilm of Hadith, this ilm of Hadith, 
Imam, Ahm, Imam Abu Ubaid actually mentions this. He says, Intal hadithu ila arba'atin. The science of hadith, it stopped at four individuals. Meaning, after these four individuals, like no one else needed to do anything more for this science. These four individuals, they were just, you can say, the final, the, the cherry on top in the science of hadith. So he says, Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba asraduhum lahu. Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba, he was the one who can enumerate the most in one sitting. He had the most ahadith with him in his memory. And then he says, Ahmad ibn Hanbal afqahuhum fihi. And Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, he had the most thick in regards to these hadith. He could derive the ahkam from these ahadith. And he goes, Wayahya ibn Ma'in ajma'uhum lahu. And Imam Yahya ibn Ibn Ma'in, he had the most, you can say, books of hadith with him. And Wa'ali ibn al-Madini a'lamuhum bihi. And the great Ali ibn al-Madini, he had the most knowledge of hadith. So these four individuals, they were the pinnacle of the science of hadith. And after that, the ulama didn't really need to do too much more tahqiq on their own because these individuals, they were just, they were just enough. But again, this is, this is debatable. This is debatable. So as, as I mentioned, he passed away in the year 235 after hijrah. This was the great Imam Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba. So now the hadith itself, as I mentioned, as I translated this hadith, it has to do with commanding to do good and forbidding evil. So now before we speak about the actual hadith itself, what is the sababul wurud? When was this hadith mentioned? And why did, for example, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu teach his students this hadith? When? So... Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali rahmatullahi alayhi mentions in his Jami'u al-Ulumi wal-Hikam from a hadith that's mentioned and narrated by Tariq ibn Shihab. He says, Awwala man bada'a bil khutbati yawm al-Eidi qabla as-salaa marwad ibn al-Hakam. That the first person to begin the khutbah of Eid, the first person, Awwala man bada'a bil khutbati yawm al-Eidi qabla as-salaa marwan. Marwan was the first person to do the khutbah of Eid before the salah itself. So how does Eid usually, how does, how, what is the format of Eid? We pray, right? We pray the two rakahs with the takbirat, and then right after the salah, the imam gives the khutbah, right? This is how the format of Eid was taught to the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa by the Prophet alayhi wa sallatu Marwan ibn al-Hakam, he was the first person to switch this around. Marwan ibn al-Hakam, he switched it around. He said, you know what? I'm gonna do the khutbah first and then do the prayer after. Why? Because Marwad ibn al-Hakam, he was one of the Umawi Khulafa. And um, he was a very controversial individual. He was very controversial. He, um, there's incidents where he committed many atrocities and many acts of injustice against the Muslim Ummah. So a lot of people, they didn't want to listen to him. They were actually tired of his lectures because he kept talking about his political views and how people should support him and so forth. And he sensed that people didn't want to listen to him anymore. So because of this reason, because of this reason on Eid, he switched it around. He's like, you know what? I'm going to make these people listen to me. I'm going to do the khutbah first. So they're forced to stay for the khutbah and the salah. So he did this. So while he stood up to give his khutbah, obviously the people were just in a state of hayran and hira. They're like, what's this guy doing? The khutbah is after. فَقَامَ إِلَيْهِ رَجُلٌ An individual stood up. فَقَالَ الصَّلَاةُ قَبْلَ الْخُطْبَةِ The salah is before the khutbah. Your khutbah should not precede the salah. What are you doing? This is not the, the, what the Prophet وسلم, did. So Marwan ibn al-Hakam, he said, Qad turika ma hunalik. He said, this has been left behind now. Don't worry about it. We're going to do it this way from now on so you people can listen to what I'm saying. Because again, Eid is the time, even in our local, in, in today's day and age, Eid, Eid is a time where everybody comes to the masjid to listen, right? So then at this time, فَقَالَ Abu Sa'idin. فَقَالَ أَبُوْ سَعِيدٍ أَمَا هَذَا فَقَدْ مَضَى مَا عَلَيْهِ ثُمَّ رَوَى هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ So Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, this was the time he mentioned this hadith. He said this is the, this is the time where Abu Sa'id actually mentioned this hadith. That whoever sees something evil, they should change it with their hands. And if that individual cannot change it with their hands, they should then do something and say something with their tongue. With their speech. And if a person is still not able to do that, they should detest it with their heart. And this is the lowest, um, the weakest of faith. This is the lowest pinnacle of faith. This is when he said this. Somebody saw Marwad al-Hakam doing something wrong and doing something evil. This man stood and he 
said that, you know what, it's wrong. This is when the hadith was mentioned by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. And we spoke about Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. This is why I don't want to speak about him today. We spoke about him in the past and who he was. Now, <clears throat> so now, there's a few other narrations that Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali brings that are similar in meaning to this hadith. One hadith he brings, it's, it's reported by Ali radiallahu anhu, he says, سَمِعَ النَّبِيَّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَقُولُ سَيَكُونُ بَعْدِي فِتَنٌ لَا يَسْتَطِيعُ الْمُؤْمِنْ فِيهَا أَنْ يُغَيِّرَ بِيَدِهِ وَلَا بِلِسَانِهِ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, he said that after me, there will be many fitness. There will be many trials and tribulations in the Muslim world. لَا يَسْتَطِيعُ الْمُؤْمِنْ فِيهَا أَنْ يُغَيِّرَ بِيَدِهِ وَلَا بِلِسَانِهِ That the believers will not be able to change or do anything with their hands. They will not physically be able to change it, nor will they even be able to say something against it with their tongues. And we're going to speak about some examples, and you could probably think of some examples as well. So then, قُلْتُ عَلِي رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ He said, يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهُ وَكَيْفَ ذَاكَ He said, how is that possible? So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, يُنْكِرُونَهُ بِقُلُوبِهِمْ He said, these people will now reject it with their hearts, as the hadith mentioned. But then Ali رضي الله عنه, he said, يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهُ وَهَلْ يَنْقُسُ ذَلِكْ إِيمَانَهُمْ شَيْئًا He said, يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهُ, you said that this is the weakest pinnacle of faith. Does this mean that our iman will now be decreased and will be deficient? The Prophet ﷺ, he said, لا إِلَّا كَمَا يَنْقُسُ الْقَطْرُ مِنَ الصَّفَى He said, no, this is not the case. This is not the case. Why? Because this individual and these individuals cannot do anything else except this. If they try to change it with their hands, their life will be in danger. If they try to even speak against it, their life will also be in danger. And we see, we'll speak about a few examples, inshallah ta'ala, of when, you know, even the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu majma'in, during the, you know, the, the reign of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, or even, you know, some of these other Umawi Khulafa, they weren't able to speak much. If they were to speak, they would have been killed. And we see Hajjaj ibn Yusuf the Zalim killed many Tabi'een, killed many Sahaba because of this. So because of this, a person, the Prophet Sallallahu he said, because of you and because of you preserving, for you to preserve your life, you should not do anything. Now we're going to speak a bit more about this. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam somewhere else, the hadith is mentioned by, it's reported by Ibn Abid Dunya, narrated by Abu Huraira. Where the Prophet ﷺ, he said, مَنْ حَضَرَ بِمَعْصِيَةٍ فَكَرِهَهَا فَكَأَنَّهُ غَابَ عَنْهَا so The Prophet ﷺ, he says, whoever حَضَرَ بِمَعْصِيَةٍ فَكَرِهَهَا Whoever sees an act of disobedience, فَكَرِهَهَا And he, he dislikes it. He shows detestment with his heart. The Prophet ﷺ, what does he say? فَكَأَنَّهُ غَابَ عَنْهَا It will be as if this person never even saw it. Because he showed dislike with his heart right and then وَمَنْ غَابَ عَنْهَا فَأَحِبَّهَا but now if a person sees an action but he shows and you can say he shows that he likes it his heart is now happy because of that evil فَكَأَنَّهُ حَضَرَهَا it will be as if this individual is actually committing that sin you see how the Prophet ﷺ has, has explained this right not weak not everybody always has the capacity to change something physically with their hands. Not everybody always has the capacity to even speak with their tongues, right? So why the Prophet ﷺ said that even if you show dislike, even for that person to show detestment with their heart, this is something great as well, right? But now if they're able to do the other two, if they're able to change it with their hand, if they're able to speak against it, but they're not doing these two, that is the problem. That is where the issue lies, right? We're going to speak about some examples as well. <clears throat> no, I mean, this shows, you know, this, this hadith, it shows that there's a wisdom behind it, right? There's a wisdom behind how a person should advise or how a person should give da'wah, right? We cannot always go around telling people off, you know, and criticizing them or physically trying to always change something. You know, sometimes this will bring more harm. Sometimes if we go to an individual, try to physically stop them, or sometimes if we go to an individual, physically speak up against them, it might bring more harm sometimes, right? So this is why this, it, it goes to the very, very famous narration of the Prophet والسلام, where he says, أَنزِلُ النَّاسَ مَنَازِلَهُمْ Approach people according to where they stand. Approach an individual according to their manzila, according to their, to their daraja. 
You can't always go and critique someone or you can't always go and physically try to change somebody. Every case will be different, right? What does this tell us? This tells us that there is an adab of nasiha. There's an adab and there's a way of correcting a person. There's a way of doing it, right? And adab is so crucial in today's day and age, especially with giving advice, right? Some people, they mean, they mean well, but they don't know how to give advice, right? You know, there's the concept of when, right? What if that person is not ready to hear the advice? What if he's angry? That's not the best time to do it. You know, or where, right? You should not, you know, and we'll speak about it. Where are you giving that advice? Are you giving advice in front of like, you know, 10, 20 people? So this person could be disgraced and dishonored? Or how are you giving that advice? Are you giving that advice in a rough, in a very cruel or harsh manner? Or are you being soft, right? These are all questions and these are all adab that a person must take into account before giving advice. We can't just stand up and be like, hey, what are you doing? Hey, this, sometimes this will make it a lot worse. And this is not what the Prophet ﷺ did, right? And adab is, as I mentioned, adab is something that my brothers and sisters, if we were to just bring this concept of adab into our lives, the world would be a much different place. The great Mawlana Rumi Balkhi, he mentions in his, in his methnawi, he speaks about the concept of adab. <clears throat> he speaks a lot about the concept of adab and the crucial importance of adab and how a person should bring adab into their lives. So he says something beautiful. He says, he says, as khuda joyim tawfiqi adab, as khuda joyim tawfiqi adab, be adab mahroom gashed as lutfira. He says, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, beg Allah to get the tawfiq and the ability to implement adab. Beg Allah. Make dua for it. Why? Because a person who does not have adab, this person is mahroom from the kindness and from the lutf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This person will be deprived from the ni'mas of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he goes and he says, he says, Be adab tanha nakhudra dasht bad. He says, Balki atash dar hama afaq zad. He said, a person who has no adab, you know, they're not only ruining themselves. A person who shows no adab, a person who goes against the concept of adab, they're not only bringing harm to themselves, but they are bringing harm upon everybody around them. It's like a fire. They are bringing harm upon, upon everybody because no one is going to want to deal with that person. No one is going to want to even socialize with that person. If anything, anytime a bay adab comes into the scenes, everyone's going to just feel a little bit uncomfortable. Like this person, you know, they might react in a certain manner and He's going to ruin this, congreg uh, this congregation or, or a majlis of ours. Right? Then he goes and he says, he says, he says, as adab purnur gashtast in falak. It's interesting. He says, as adab purnur gashtast in falak. Was adab, ma was adab ma'su mupak amad malak. He says, this adab, because of adab, these constellations and heavens are full of nur. Why? One of the main reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, how he created angels, them being very obedient. But what does this entail? They have the highest degree of adab. Because of their adab, the skies are full of nur. Adab is something that takes a person to another level. This is what he's trying to tell us here in this poem. If you have adab, you're going to be different from everybody else. It's like, it's like a ruby within a patch of rocks. You look into a patch of a thousand rocks, yet you can see where that ruby stands. You'll see that ruby standing out. This is what adab does to a person. It beautifies a person, right? And not to digress too much, but Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahmatullahi alayhi, he says, this, this is mentioned in his book, Kitab al-Zuhud, and Ibn al-Qayyim al, al also mentions this in Madarij al-Salikin, in his very famous book. Abdullah ibn Mubarak, he says, مَن تَهَاوَنَ بِالْأَدَبِ عُوْقِبَ بِحُرْمَانِ السُّنَةِ and I, my brothers and sisters, this hadith, when I, or this, this quote of Abdullah ibn Mubarak, when I read this quote, I just, I look at many problems of our community being, um, uh, being based off of this. He says, whoever disregards or whoever neglects adab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish this person by making the sunnah haram upon him. This person will not have the tawfiq to now follow the sunnah. 
Because what? Because of the lack of adab. And then he goes and he says, whoever disregards or neglects the sunnah, we always hear this saying, oh, it's, tana sunnah, it's only a sunnah. This. Whoever does this and disregards and neglects sunnah, Allah will punish this person by making it haram for them to practice the fara'id properly. Ajeeb. And then he goes and he says, he says, Man tahawana bil fara'id, uqiba bi hurman al ma'rifa. Whoever disregards or neglects the fara'id, things that are fard in Islam, Allah will make it haram for this person to even recognize who Allah is. Think about this now. It's like a domino effect. It starts with what? With adab. You have adab, inshallah ta'ala, everything else will fall in line. But now, one of the biggest issues with not only our community, but it's the Muslim ummah as a whole is we have no adab. We don't know when to speak. We don't know when to stay silent. We don't know how to speak. We don't know who to speak to. It's just a freestyle of everybody thinking they know what they're doing. When in reality, they're just destroying it. As the great Mawlana said, he said that, People who have no adab, they're just destroying everything around them. And it's true. The importance of adab, you know, you can have a whole lecture series just on this concept. May Allah Azza wa Jal grant us implementation. So as I mentioned, this hadith is about amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar. Commanding to do good and forbidding evil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many places in the Quran, he has spoken about this. One, the very famous um, the very famous ayah in Surah Ali Imran, verse 110, bil ma'roof wa anil munkar. Right? When the Mufassirin speak about this ayah, what does Allah say? He says, Kuntum khayra ummatin. You are the best of ummas who have been taken out of people. You are the best of ummas. You are the best of nations. The ulama, they say that Allah is answering this question to why they're the best right in, in the next sentence. Why? Because the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa it's an onus and responsibility on everybody to do this. To advise one another. Tell people to do good and tell people to stay away from bad. This is one of the reasons why Bani Israel were cursed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ma'idah, he says, He says, لُعِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ بَنِي Israel." He says that the people of Bani Israel, they were cursed. And in the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says why they were cursed. And this is verse 79 of Surah Ma'idah. He says, Kanu la yatanahawna am munkarin fa'alu. Bani Israel, they used to not stop one another from doing evil whenever somebody would do it. Whenever they would see somebody doing something wrong, they wouldn't say anything. They would be like, oh, it's all good. Let him do it. It doesn't bother us. This is one of the reasons why they were cursed. This is why we're different than all these other nations. We have this onus and responsibility on us so much so that what is the hukum now there's a question what is the hukum and ruling of you know this concept of amr bil ma'roof in nahi an al munkar of telling people to do good and forbidding evil mulla ali al qari rahmatullahi alayhi he says that it's a fard kifaya what does this mean that if that if a portion of the ummah is doing it if the portion of the community is doing it then it will be sufficient it's better for everyone to do it but if everyone is not doing it, if a portion of the community is doing it, then it's fine. But if nobody is doing it, this is the problem. This is where there, there is a problem. Now we're not doing something that Allah has commanded as a fard for the community, right? So now another question comes is, who should be doing this? Who should be you know, commanding to do good and forbidding evil? Mullah Ali Al-Qari in his book, Mirqat, Mirqat Al-Mafatih, it's a common a commentary on the great book Mishkatul Masabih. Mullah Ali Al-Qari, he's a scholar from the 16th century. He's from Herat. Great alim. Great alim. He says, قَالَ بَعْضُ عُلَمَائِنَا that Some of our scholars, they say that it falls on three people, three categories. الْأَمْرُ الْأَوَّلْ لِلْأُمَرَى The first should be for the Amirs, for the leaders. These are the first people to be taking this responsibility of Amr bil ma'roof and Nahi عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ he says, number two, athani lil ulama, for the scholars. The scholars should be doing this as well. And he says, wa thalith li amatil mu'minin, for all believers. This is what he said. There's three categories. It starts with the umara, then with the ulama, and then with every single belief. Everybody should be doing it. Everybody should be doing it, right? This is what Mullah Ali al Qari, rahmatullahi alayhi, he says. Now, so now there's a very scary narration, as I mentioned, if people aren't doing this. 
So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hadith is mentioned in the sunan of uh, Imam Abu Dawood. He says, مَا مِنْ رَجُلٍ يَكُونُ فِي, يكون في قَوْمٍ بِعَمَلٍ فِيهِمْ بِالْمَعْصِيَّ يَقْدِرُونَ أَنْ يُغَيِّرُوا عَلَيْهِ فَلَمْ يُغَيِّرُوا إِلَّا أَصَابَهُمْ اللَّهُ بِعِقَابٍ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَمُوتُوا He says that there's not an individual who sees people doing something bad, right? And these, these individuals, they see people doing things that are evil. They are able to stop it. They see it. They are able to stop it or they are able to speak against it, but they choose not to. They choose not to change it. What's going to happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make sure that they get a great punishment before they pass away. Allah will punish, punish that entire qawm and tribe before they leave this world. So we see the wa'id here of seeing things that are wrong and you know leaving it as is and not doing anything about it. Right? If we have the capacity to change something physically or by our speech, we should do so. Right? Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, who is the narrator of this hadith, he says that, Samir Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqulu fi khutbati, is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was once saying, uh, giving some advice in one of his khutbas. He said, Ala la yamna'anna rajulan haybatan nasi ay yaqula bi haqqin idha alima. That nothing should stop a person. Fear of or being scared of people should not stop a person from speaking haq when they know or when they know of something is wrong. You should not be scared of anybody, especially being afraid of the people. And this really does imply to today's day and age. If we say the truth, or we, if, we, if, we, if we speak the truth in today's day and age, who are we to be afraid of? Can anybody harm us? No, nobody can do anything. We're literally, we're living in a free environment. If we see somebody doing something wrong, right? We should not be scared of our reputation or them or whatever. There's no excuse for this in today's day and age. You know, in other countries, possibly, like we see in, in, in Saudi, right? You have many ulama who spoke out against, you know, whatever they're doing, right? A lot of them were jailed. Some have even passed away, right? Now we're going to speak about this. Should they have spoken out or should they have stayed silent? We'll speak about what the Prophet ﷺ actually says about this. So now, this is, this is um, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. Then he says, Wabaka. He says, he started to cry. Abu Sa'id radiallahu anhu began to cry when he narrated this hadith. He said, Qad wallahi ra'ayna ashya fahibna. He said, wallahi, we've seen so many things, but we were scared to do anything. We were scared for our lives. This is Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu speaking. So now, this was a justified fear, right? They had a justified fear. You had the Khulafa at that time killing anybody who spoke against them, right? They, you know, and you have stories of individuals not only killing the person who spoke out against them, but even killing their families. So this was a justified type of fear for the preservation of life, which is one of the maqasid of Islam. We spoke about this, right? When it comes to the preservation of life, then there's... You do what you got to do to preserve life. This was their excuse in Udr. <clears throat> so now a question comes. There's a narration mentioned by the great Mufassir Sa'id ibn al-Jubayr. He says, I said to Ibn Abbas that the Sultan, Amr al-Sultan bil ma'roof wa anhahu an al-munkar. He says, should I go to the Sultan and should I tell him to do what is right and should I forbid him to do evil? This is Abdullah ibn Abbas giving the advice. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says, If you're scared that this person is going to kill you, then don't. It's better to stay silent. He repeated this question. He repeated the question. And Abdullah ibn, Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Abbas said the same thing. So he repeated it. He kept repeating this question that, are you sure I should not go do this? And Abdullah ibn Abbas, he kept saying that, you should not if you're scared that he's going to kill you. Don't say anything. So now this is, this is a piece of advice that Abdullah ibn Abbas gave. right? But now the Prophet وسلم, in another narration, um, narrated by Abu, Abu, Ubaid, Abu Ubaidat ibn Jarrah, he says that, I asked the Prophet وسلم, he said, Ya Rasulullah, ayyu shuhada akramu ala Allah. Which type of shaheeds, which type of martyrs are the most noble in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? 
The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, رَجُلًا قَامَ إِلَىٰ إِمَامٍ جَائِرٍ فَأَمَرَهُ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنَهَاهُ عَنْ مُنْكَرٍ فَقَتَلَهُ He says that the most noble shaheed in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that individual who stands up in front of a tyrant ruler and tells him to do what is right and forbids him to do what is wrong and he dies and he gets killed because of it. This is the most noble type of shaheed in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But now there's a question that we hear different conflicting conflicting advice. Abdullah ibn Abbas saying, you know, stay silent if you're scared he's going to kill you. But now the question is here, it's a very straightforward answer. That everyone's heart is different. Some people, they do not have the taqa, they do not have the capacity to stay silent if they see something wrong. It's in their nature, they have to say something. And if people are of that nature, then this is the reward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them if they were to die on that path. But sometimes, and sometimes their death actually shakes the ummah. Their death actually shakes the ummah. We see with the death of Imam Hussein radiallahu anhu, what happened, right? His death shook the ummah during that time. I don't want to talk about the ripple effects it gave in today's day and age. But at that time, it shook the ummah to a point where it made everybody stand up against Yazid. And against the Umawis, right? So sometimes a person passing and dying in this path has a ripple effect that brings change. But sometimes a person's death in this path brings nothing. Sometimes it brings nothing. So if that's the case, then a person's heart, based on where they stand and based on what they can endure, it will be judged and it will be looked at. Now, so now, I guess I mentioned, you know, in today's day and age, we don't fear for our lives. Well, maybe with changing it with our hands, we can't do. But every single one of us in today's day and age can at least say something with our tongues. And we're going to speak about the adab of how a person should do that. But in today's day and age, the onus of this falls on everybody. The onus of this should fall on everybody. Now there's a question. The hadith mentions and says, Man ra'a. Whoever sees an evil act, they should, they should try to change it. So is the condition mawquf and pending on seeing something wrong? What if you don't see it? What if you don't see it? What's going to happen? So now, some ulama, they say that it is muta'alliq bir ru'ya. That yes, it's only when you see something that you should try to change it. If you don't see it, then it's none of your business. But other ulama, they... In, interpret this word of seeing as alima, as knowing of it. If you know of something, if you know of something, and if you have a strong indication in Qarina with witnesses or with this, that you know something wrong is going on, you should change it. It's not based on only looking. It's based on also knowing of something and having knowledge of that thing being wrong. And if you hear something, for example, you hear something that somebody is doing something wrong or whatever it is, don't make an assumption before speaking to the person. If you hear something, don't set it in your mind and don't, you know, don't come to a judgment immediately. If you hear something wrong about that someone is doing something, go and confront them. Be like, you know, in a nice way, be like, brother or sister, I heard this. Is this true? They'll, some people will admit it if they're close to you and if you're sincere. Others might say no. If they admit it, that is when you give the nasiha. That is when you try to change it with your tongue. If they don't admit it, then the responsibility has now been uplifted from you. If they don't admit it, the responsibility has now been uplifted for you. Make dua for that person. Tayyib? Now, so now, this leads to something else. Now, don't spy on some, don't spy on somebody for the sake of just finding out or looking or finding information about them. Sometimes we hear something about somebody that they're doing something bad, now we go and start spying on them. We go, we try to, you know, we go to their gatherings or we now try to like ask everybody, you know, have you, did, does this person do this? Does this person do that? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the Quran, he says, Wala tajassasu. Do not spy on one another. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the Quran and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam both forbid spying on one another. Right, and there's, there's a very interesting narration. And this goes, and this should put, things in the perspective that somebody came to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu and they said to him inna fulanan taqattara lihyatuhu khamran that a person his beard smells or his beard is dripping alcohol 
Meaning he's drinking alcohol and it got in his beard and now his, his beard is now dripping or smelling of alcohol. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud did not see this. Somebody's telling him about this, right? What did Abdullah ibn Mas'ud say? He says, Nahan Allahu an it tajassus. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbid us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbid us to go and spy on people. If you don't know for sure, don't assume. Don't go and spy and don't go and try to, you know, establish your facts against somebody to try to ridicule them or dishonor. But now, the great Qadi Abu Ya'la, he mentions in his book, sometimes you are allowed to spy. Sometimes you're allowed to spy on a person based on different qara'in and things are, are indicating factors. When, when a person, when you hear about a person, he, he or she is planning to kill somebody. You are now allowed to go and look into this person's life. Are they actually planning this? Right? Because these are, these, are, these are huge kabair. These are huge things that now it, does not, it, does, it doesn't only harm themselves, but not, it, it harms society. So for things that harm society, individuals are allowed to go and seek and ask about it. Okay? Or for example, if you, another example is when a person gets a proposal. And there's many hadith about this as well. The Prophet ﷺ actually mentions this, that one of the, you know, ghibah is allowed when? When somebody, let's say they have a daughter. They come and ask you, or let's, let's say somebody is coming, pr proposing for your daughter. You are now allowed to go around and ask about that individual. And that person you ask, they are allowed to tell you that man's or that boy's bad qualities or that girl's bad qualities. Because now it's a matter of a person's life, a person's future being good or bad. So in these instances, uh, in these circumstances, a person is allowed to go around and ask around uh, about that individual. And a person is allowed to go and, you can say, spill the news on that person and tell them how they are. Because now it's not only you getting affected, it's a person's life getting affected. So we have to be very honest about this kind of stuff, my brothers and sisters. Because sometimes, look, we see this sometimes in families. A boy wants to get married. A girl wants to get married. Somebody's looking for a wife um, for their son. And they're going around, oh, my son is an angel. My son does this. My son does that. Or vice versa. My daughter is an angel. She's so good. And she does that. When in reality, it's the mother or father, either they're lying or either they're just in denial. But we don't know that this person is now going to go be with a person and that person might, that person's life might get ruined. So we have to be honest about these kind of things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask us on Qiyamah if we're not honest about these things. That's why when a person comes, me personally, <laughs> I try to avoid these types of things. Because I don't want to be the means of a person's life either going down the drain or a person's life being um, good. It's, it's too much of a risk. But if you know a person's good, for example, you can say, yeah, you know, I see this person coming to the masjid. I see this person coming to the masjid praying five times a day. He has very good adab. Aside from that, I don't know too much, but this is what I see. Be honest, right? But if you know that a person is doing something wrong, that they live a, you know, a, a two-faced life or whatever it is, somebody asks you about it in regards to a topic of marriage or this, you should be honest about it because you don't want to ruin a person's life. And we see this, my brothers and sisters. Also. There's so many examples of this. SubhanAllah. There's an example I can think about back in B.C., there was a girl who got married to her first cousin. This guy, everybody knew he would party. Everybody knew he would drink. Everybody knew he would, you know, whatever. He did whatever. Everybody knew. But for some reason, nobody told the girl's family that the guy was doing this. And the girl, mashallah, was a Muslim, a mu'mina, mashallah. They got married. After a few years, this girl, this, you know, what do you expect? The guy started doing the same things. He was going around, he had affairs, he was still going partying, still drinking, and this girl's at home by herself making dua to Allah, that, Ya Allah, this is what I'm facing. You know what I mean? And this girl's life was ruined. Why? Because no one was honest to go and tell the girl's family that, hey, this is a bad idea. This guy's doing this, this guy's like this, this guy's like this. This girl's life could have been saved. But because of people's, you know, whatever it was, they didn't want to get involved or whatever it is, sometimes it's good to get involved. Again, this is, this is where this hadith... This is where this hadith comes into play, right? We see a proposal going and one of the persons are very bad or you know that they're, they're doing something wrong. You will speak to that person. If they're still doing it, go and tell the family. Like, 
we just, I just want you to know, you know, it's my duty, it's my responsibility that this boy or this girl is, is living this type of life. You should, you should know this, right? And a, a lot of mis uh, misconception people have today is, oh, if my son or if my daughter, let's say the daughter is bad, let's just say hypothetically, or let's say that the son is bad, whatever. If they marry a good spouse, it's going to change their life. This is a very unfair, unfair, I mean, uh, unfair thing to, to expect. Yeah, it's a possibility that their life might change, but what if it doesn't? You're now torturing that person you got them married with. It's a very important, a very important message that we should really think about, my brothers and sisters. Now, so now the last discussion <clears throat> is how do we advise a person? Kaif, how do we give advice to a person? And now it'll it'll all depend. Every situation and scenario will depend on its own. But these are the general rules. So the first, Imam Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi, he mentioned a beautiful, beautiful um, piece of advice. He says, Man sirran faqad nasahahu. Whoever advises his brother or sister in secret, meaning in private, then that individual has really given advice. Advising them in private. If you advise a person in private, then that is considered true nasiha. Then he goes and he says, Waman wa'adahu alaniyatan faqad fadahahu wa shanahu. However, if a person goes and advises an individual openly in front of everybody, what have you done? You have now uncovered their faults and exposed them and dishonored them. This is not nasiha anymore. This is not nasiha anymore. If you're doing it in, in open and in front of everybody. But again, I mentioned that sometimes there's different cases. An example I'll mention is sometimes in the masjid, a person stands up and starts screaming and making a big fuss in the masjid in front of everybody that, oh, you should do this or, oh, you should do that. In these types of cases, personally, I think that person should be told off in front of everybody. That's just my, that's, that's what we've seen from our ulama as well. When a person is causing fitna in front of people, when a person is bringing it, they're basically, they're bringing it upon themselves. When a person is doing that, now that person should be rebuked in front of everyone as well. But if a person is making a mistake, you should go. And if they're not causing a fitna or a stir up, go advise them in private. This is what nasiha is. Then the next piece of advice, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, he says, he says, يَأْمُرُوا بِالْرِفْقِ وَالْخُضُوعِ فَإِنْ أَسْمَعُوهُ مَا يَكْرَهُ لَا يَغْضَى Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, he says that a person should give nasiha in a very kind, gentle, humble manner. To a point that even if they hear something they dislike, they're not going to get angry because you're speaking to them in a way that they can't get angry at. Right? So speaking to them, giving advice in a kind, gentle manner, this is the next piece of advice. And how do we expect someone to, t to take our advice if we're just bashing them and screaming at them, right? It doesn't work like that, right? You got to advise them in a kind, gentle manner. And the third quote I want to mention, Sufyan al-Thawri, he mentions this. And it's beautiful how he says, he says, لا يأمر بالمعروف ولا ينهى عن المنكر إلا من كان فيه ثلاث, ثلاث خصال. He said that a person should only give advice or command or tell someone to do good and forbid evil only if they have three qualities. What are these three qualities? The first is what? Rafiqun bima ya'mur wa rafiqun bima yanha. If they're commanding somebody or telling somebody to do something good, they are doing it in a kind and gentle manner. Like so, when they're stopping somebody from doing something evil, they are also doing that in a kind, gentle manner. Kindness. This is the first thing Abdullah Sufyan Thawri says. The second thing, this person is just in what they're saying. The way they're telling somebody to do something is in a just manner. And the way they're forbidding somebody from evil is also in a just manner. I'll give you an example. Let's say there's an individual <clears throat> who is a part of a corrupt organization. Let's say we know that this organization is corrupt. But this person working with this organization, he's, very, he's a very good person, and he is actually working with this organization to try to bring change into them. His niya is, his niya is clear, his niya is clean. It's a pure niya, intention. So now, to give advice with justice, we should not go now and bash this individual because of what the, in the, what, what the organization is doing. Because this person's intention are good. His or her intentions are good. So we should not bash that person based on what the organization is doing when this person is trying to bring change. So again, give advice with justice. Take that person's um, condition into account. 
This is the second. And the third, the third piece of advice he gives, he gives that the third quality a person should have when giving advice is what? Alimun bima ya'mur wa alimun bima yanha. So this person, he has ilm of what he is saying. He or she has knowledge of what they're talking about. They're not just going and blabbering and saying whatever. They have ilm. They're speaking with knowledge. That person, my, like my brother or my sister, you should not do this because of this reason. Or you should do this because of their, this reason. There's ilm behind it, right? They're not just going and blabbering. Because there's a lot of people who, tries to, who try to give advice. with no. I mean, they're, they're just literally just going off and saying, saying nothing that really makes, makes sense. Naam. Now, so they should know what they're talking about, but now they should also be, they should also be a fa'il of, of what they're talking about. They should also be a doer of what they are talking about. Right? We hear this concept of a person should give advice when they are acting upon the advice themselves. This concept has some truth to it. There's a hadith that's mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said that a man will be brought on the day of resurrection. A man will be brought on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and this person will be thrown into the fire. This person's intestines will spill forth in the fire and he will just be walking around the entire thing. And the people of Jahannam, the people of Jahannam will gather around and they will say, you know, you know, what is the matter with you? Why is your intestines out? And why are you walking around just wandering in Jahannam? What, are, what did you do? And this person, they, uh, they ask, they, they will ask, did you not enjoin what is good? And did you not forbid what is evil? And this person will answer, he will say, yes, but I used to enjoy, but I used to enjoin good and not act upon it. And I used to forbid evil, but I used to do that evil myself. I'd be telling somebody to do it, to do something good, but I would not be doing it. I would tell somebody to, be, to stop doing something haram, but I would be doing it. This is why we should be a fa'il, a doer of what we, uh, what we uh, advise. And my brothers and sisters, this goes to the very famous concept that Islam is experiential. Islam is experiential. Islam and da'wah will have the greatest effect on a person when the da'i is actually acting upon what he or she is saying and doing. Okay? So, we have many khutbahs where we hear goes in one ear come out the other but at the same time sometimes we have these khutbahs we hear where it really really does resonate in our hearts that's because the speaker who is speaking they are speaking with amal they are speaking because they are speaking in in a, in a manner that they are also acting upon that advice as well they are also doing it as well i was speaking to one of the students of um, hamza yusuf sheikh hamza yusuf a beautiful individual ustad firaidun he mentioned that you know we're, we've been trying to get Sheikh Hamza Yusuf to do a course on environment, Islamic environmentalism and is Islamic cleansiness. But uh, Hamza Yusuf, he keeps saying, no, I don't want to do it because my house does not match the standards of Islam yet. Once my house meets those standards, then I'll go and speak about it because I'll be acting upon it. But until then, I don't want to have nothing to do with it. Right? So when a person is experiencing these, these ruhani, the ruhaniya aspects, these spiritual things that you know because of their doing it they're experiencing it when they speak about those same things it will pierce a person's heart when they're doing it right so this is why this is why my brothers and sisters you know another reason why changing up yourself is so important it doesn't only it's not only a favor to the individual who changed but it's also an individual to the people around them because now whenever that person speaks it's going to have weight Whenever that person speaks, it's, it, they're now going to have weight, right? It's a very beautiful concept that I've really been, and we should all be thinking about. That we want to see change in our communities. We, we got to stop some of our bad habits as well. We want to see our community doing certain things. We should also have istiqama on those things as well. It starts with, with us, right? And gaining the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? If when you have the love of Allah Azza wa Jal through these means, you're gonna see that change will come, right? Maulana he mentions in his Mathnawi again about Ishq. He says, Ishq on Bugzin Kijumla Ambiya. 
سید عشق آن بگذین که جمله انبیا یافتند از عشق او کار و کیا He says gain the love of the person gain the love of Allah Azza wa Jal right why because every single prophet when they found the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they found the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah gave it to them and this is not only to the to the anbiya this is with any da'i when they gained the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is when their work was the most had the most impact that is when they 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 got the most glory and that is when their work went the furthest gaining the love of Allah getting close to Allah by bringing these things into our lives and these are just some some things um some pieces of advice from this hadith there are many more things we can speak about with this hadith but but um these are things um i decided to mention because these are things we are lacking in today's day and age if we're lacking in something we should speak about it to remind ourselves right والمؤمنون والمؤمنات بعضهم أولياء بعض الله سبحانه وتعالى إن القرآن they say that the believers they are friends and أولياء to one another why يأمرون بالمعروف وينهون عن المنكر they're telling one another to do good and they're forbidding one another to be to to to, to, to stay away from evil this is what makes one another this is what makes all of us أولياء and friends to each other so this is a reminder. This hadith, in essence, is a concept of amr bil ma'roof and nahi al munkar. May Allah subhanahu wa taala grant us all tawfiq to act upon what has been heard and said. Jazakum Allahu khayra wa ahsan al jaza. Aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ili muslimin fa astaghfiruhu innahu huwa al ghafur rahim.